Well, thank you for joining the Ask the Expert session on exploring weight management and weight-related behaviors on, for individuals living with spina bifida. The content addressed today is in response to your questions during the community information session held in January on this very topic, as well as some of the questions submitted when you register for this session. My name is Laura Carlson, and I am the SBA's research coordinator, and I also serve on the Research Advisory Council. I am also an adult with spina bifida. We are joined by my colleagues, Juanita Pan Leonard from SBA's National Research Resource Manager, and Jessica Palmieri, SBA's National Director of Marketing and Communications. Thank you for joining us. I want to mention a few things before we get started. You will remain muted throughout the session. This is because we want to allow the experts to respond to all of the questions that you have submitted in advance of this session. You are welcome to submit any questions that you may have to the panel of experts, but please use the Q&A feature on Zoom. Recognize also that if time allows, the experts will answer your questions today. But if we run out of time, the questions that you ask during the session tonight, we will try to answer them at the next session, which is scheduled on February 22nd. A new link will be sent out for that for you to register. Everyone who registered for this event will receive that link to the recording for this evening's session, along with some more resources. Closed captioning is enabled if you need that. If you have any technical issues, please send a text to Juanita at 202-487-3988. When I'm done with these announcements, I'll text, put that in the text or the chat, excuse me. Now I am pleased to introduce tonight's experts they're the same as the ones we had um, at the community information session. And so we are thrilled that they can be with us again tonight to answer your questions. Um, as you can see on the screen, moving from uh, starting at the left, we have uh, Dr. Teresa Preitzer, who is an assistant professor, Department of Physical Therapy at Duquesne University, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, which with lots of um, credentials. Michelle Pultis, also um, PhD RN, Joint Research Chair in the Nursing of Children, University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. We also have um, tonight, Jennifer Tudor, PhD Associate Professor of Biology at St. Joseph's University in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And Last but not least, we have um, Joanne Wellen, who also has a PhD, um, Director of Master of Science and Dietetic Internship Program, Clinical Assistant Professor, Indiana University, Indianapolis. And they have a lot more credentials that um, are on the resources that we send out that I'm not sharing tonight. They're up there on the, on the screen. So thank you, and uh, I'll turn it over to our panel. So the first question that one of the first questions that we wanted to address um, that was submitted by you, or one of you, was how does weight management differ for people with spina with spina bifida versus a typical child or adult? Okay. I'm going to take that answer. Um, so first of all, very good question. And what I want to say, and this is coming back from what we talked about with our last um, lecture, is that overall, weight management is hard for everyone. And it's just really frustrating and complex. We do know that there's more similarities than differences, but there are some um, basic things that everyone deals with, such as your genetic makeup, your hormones, your environment, um, your culture, your family, your peers, your job. And all those things can really impact and make a difference on weight management. Some unique differences for individuals with spina bifida that we have to consider is that some have shorter stature or decreased muscle mass. And then there's also this unknown decreased energy expenditure that can play a role. 
So all of those parts do create additional challenges that have to be noted. What? The last thing that I'll notice is, or note is that um, either, even with the additional challenges, we know that the outcomes or the secondary problems that can occur when you have obesity and spina bifida are paramount and they need to be um, discussed as far as there's additional barriers to being active, negative health influences such as mental health and skin breakdown and injury as a poor mechanics on how you're moving and it will affect your independence and quality of life. So the priority is to talk um, is to deal with weight management early even though it is hard. I'm sorry, I was muted. Uh, would you like to take the next questions as well, Michelle? Sure, sure I can. So we're looking at talking about how to best measure um, weight or a healthy weight. And there's some very specifics in here related to ages and height. Um, and to make this a little bit more general, what I want to discuss is that there can be multiple answers here, depending on what setting that you're talking about. And in the perfect world, we really don't want to just say healthy weight, um, but we really would rather know how much body fat is our body carrying and how much is too much. And to do that, we need to know body composition. And we also would love to know where that body fat is being carried because we know that there are certain places on our body like our ab, the belly region that can be creating more problems and more risk for secondary problems like diabetes or cardiovascular disease. So to do that, you would need to have a body composition analysis done. And there's different mechanisms to do that, such as a DEXA scan or um, some very high tech measures like um, underwater weighing or bioelectric impedance monitors. So those are not the typical norm that you're gonna find in any clinical setting. And so when we're talking about a clinical setting, which I'm not sure if that's what was being referred to or not, we typically will use things like our body mass index. And if you remember the body mass index, it's often called a BMI. It's a calculation and it's a calculation based on your weight in kilograms divided by your height in meters square. And for adults that will provide a number. And based on that number, you can categorize weight as being underweight, healthy weight, normal or overweight or obese. The same thing can happen with children, but the number is not specific to those categories. That number has to be placed on a graph. And then when it's placed on a graph, it gives a percentage uh, and then that gets them in the category of underweight, normal weight, overweight, or obese. The CDC has a great website to calculate your BMI. So you don't need to worry about knowing that calculation. You just input your own height and weight, and then it will also determine what category that you fall under. Um, I want to say that we know from our last discussion, the BMI has um, some concerns when used with spina bifida, and we have to recognize that it is only a proxy of body fat. It's not specific. So that being said, um, you have to take it for what it's worth and use it as a trend and as a starting place and a place to talk with your healthcare provider. Um, and the last thing I'll say is if you are looking for a body composition analysis, much more detail provided, you can look online in your community and there are research units at universities or sometimes at the hospital. We have a clinical tr um, translational research unit that, or even some gyms that will offer body composition analysis for community members. And obviously that would be a much more detailed um, report than what you're gonna get with a BMI. Thank you, Michelle. Thanks. And so now we have some questions about nutrition that um, Joanne, we would like you to address, please. Um, and the first one was, what could be a substitute to nuts for people who are allergic to nuts? Sure, that's a great question. We definitely want to have sources of protein in our diet, and that can be a little bit challenging for people that might have a, a reaction or a, an immune response to the protein that are that's present in nuts. So finding good alternatives to nuts in the diet would definitely be helpful. So some things to consider would possibly be some nut butters or um, seed butters, for example, as an alternative to the nut. Uh, so sunflower butter could be an option, uh, potentially pumpkin seeds, chia seeds. Those are all different variations that might offer some more alternatives and protein choices. Chickpeas could be another example, and those can even be uh, um, 
placed in an air fryer and, and made to be crunchy to give that uh, similar satisfaction or similar resemblance to nuts. Other sources might even uh, be edamame, so soy products in the diet. Other things that we might be thinking about already, for example, would be yogurts, milks and cheeses. And so those are some foods to replace in the diet for those that might be potentially allergic. Okay, and what about, um, could you please address difficulties in digesting animal protein? And what might be examples of plant-based or easily digested sources of protein? Sure, that, that is a great question as well. And taking that into account, it might be an individual-based uh, scenario and, and talking to your provider about that if you feel like that might be a case that you're experiencing would definitely be helpful to get, to get the best guidance on that as far as why animal protein and digestion might become more challenging. In some maybe typical cases or potential uh, causes might be just sometimes as we age, we might have less acid that's present in the stomach. So digestion of some animal foods could become more challenging just as we age in general. So some options there that are easily digested protein sources, and, and some proteins do have protein scores of digestibility, but a plant-based option could be, again, something, some foods that are in the soy family. So that could be soy milks, uh, tofu, edamame, for example, uh, soy nuts could be an option as well. And then looking at some fermented soy products. So that might be tempeh or miso. So those are some examples too. And I know that's more plant-based options, but there are other uh, proteins that could be more digestible too. So for example, an egg has a better digestion score than some uh, other animal protein sources, but that's just some examples there. Thank you. And what are some beneficial diets for people with spina bifida? Sure. And I think this gets back to thinking about what are general healthy recommendations really for all individuals. And when considering that, we can kind of look at the guidelines for Americans and, and looking at foods to incorporate that might become more uh, similar with diets that we hear about in the news and, and so forth. So making sure that those foods we include are whole grains when we have those choices of carbohydrates in the diet, making sure at least 50% or more are from whole grains, and then including fruits and vegetables. So getting a variety of all food groups in there and making every meal or at least half your plate coming from fruits or vegetables. <clears throat> Other foods uh, to include and in, in, um, things to consider in the diet would be getting in low fat dairy sources there to round out the diet and to get in adequate calcium and vitamin D supplementation there. In addition there too, we wanna to make sure we have some good lean protein sources. So that would include uh, good fish sources, potentially lean meats, uh, chicken or uh, plant-based uh, options. There would be soy <clears throat> as an option as well. A lot of people in the media have heard of the Mediterranean diet, and it was voted the, the best diet for the, I believe, the seventh year in a row because of the emphasis on whole grains, fruits, vegetables, omega-3 fatty acids. So those are things to consider, but making sure there's also adequate dairy or a source there to get those calcium and uh, vitamin D that's necessary there as well is also key to round out the diet. Thank you. And how would you reverse insulin resistance if physical activity is not possible? And thinking about insulin resistance, even making diet changes immediately can have an impact on insulin resistance. So thinking about foods that are really concentrated in sugar and, and cutting out those foods and starting to reduce those to maybe just a couple of times a week. So you still have a little bit there in the diet, but that can have a good a uh, change in the way our body is responding and help reduce insulin resistance. So th then also think about how to replace those foods then. So adding in more whole grains, adding, adding in those good protein sources or adequate uh, protein at all meals and snacks will help balance out blood sugar levels and help reduce the insulin resistance. And how Another question was, I use a wheelchair and I'm not able to exercise as an able-bodied person. 
is there a different formula for figuring out how many calories I should be eating and how much water I should have per day? Absolutely. And I, and I think taking into consideration, looking at one size just does not fit all. And so looking at who we are as individuals, how tall we are, where our body weight is, what our activity level is, definitely plays a factor in how much calories and how much total energy we would need in a day. The government does have the website that's available and it's uh, the myplate.gov website. And you can go there and look at my plate plan and hit the start button and enter in some of your own information there to help personalize eating just for you and what your activity level might be. And I think we've gone ahead and put that in the chat. So thank you. That might be helpful uh, resource for lots of individuals. Additionally, looking, thinking about water and, and anytime we, we think about fluid consumption, we want to definitely think about uh, how much we need for just kind of daily hydration. And a lot of times that's, it's solely based on what our body weight is. So the calculations are, are in place to calculate that out as well as considering what the bowel management plan would be and making sure that we have that balance and preventing constipation while also getting an adequate fluid to stay hydrated is key. So there are calculations that are there. So rough estimates are about uh, half of what your body weight is in pounds would be the amount you would need in ounces. So I'll say that again, it's typically about what roughly you want about half of your body weight in pounds to equal that of how much fluid you would need in ounces per day. That's kind of a rough estimate. Other things you can do, you can always do the urine check and see how concentrated the urine looks and, and to kind of know if, if hydration might be on par or not. Is there a special diet that um, persons with spina bifida should consider? Should they follow regular nutrition standards? Sure. And th that is a fantastic question. And just kind of thinking about general nutrition guidelines for, for all individuals and, and modifications to know that we want to emphasis here on getting those whole grains, those fruits, vegetables to get in the adequate fiber sources. So we want to consider other special considerations, for example, just any uh, bowel regimen plan. Uh, those are things to consider as well as getting an adequate hydration, but making sure too that we, we're getting foods from all the food categories and um, making sure we have a variety there in the diet so we meet all of the, the vitamin mineral goals that we need as well. And speaking of vitamins, um, what do you what are your thoughts on vitamins and supplements? That is a fantastic question. And I, I hear that and get questioned on that a lot. And I think it's important to note that typically if we can get in all food groups daily, which can, for some individuals could be challenging, but if we do get a variety and from all food groups and we aren't eliminating any food groups in particular, we, we generally get in all the vitamin minerals supplement and um, vitamin minerals that we are, we need. It's when we start eliminating food groups that's when I would encourage you to talk to your healthcare provider to see how you can get those minerals, vitamins back in if it's not coming from those food sources. So that's when I would definitely recommend that you talk to your provider to figure out what might be the appropriate plan for, for you. And one of the questions was from someone who said, um, I've been having brain fog and really feeling lethargic, probably due to illness or medication. I also have, and I'm not going to say this correctly, for minor stenosis, could certain food, dietary supplements, and physical therapy help with this issue? And and I and I think that is a great question. And I think definitely one to talk over with your provider. So I appreciate that. And kind of thinking about it certainly could be the, you know, whether it's time of year, whether it's an illness, whether it's something else kind of going on, knowing that uh you can think about all the foods to, to include in the diet and getting in all the food groups and a variety there. So if something might be missing, maybe think about that first too, to see, you know, are you getting whole grains? Are you limiting the, the high sugary type foods and, and getting that good balance in at all meals and snacks? And, and definitely talk to your healthcare provider about that and to see if, if something is missing in the diet, is there a possibility that that, that could mean something could be an issue. 
So that that's definitely where I would say that could be more of an individual uh, plan might need to be in place there. But that's a that is a great question. Great, thank you. All right, so now I think we have um, the next section on physical activity. And um, Teresa, would you like to go ahead and help us out with that? Sure. Thank you. So the first question is, what is the most suitable exercise for someone with uh, spina bifida who has the myelomeningocele type who is able to walk? And for a person with myelomeningocele who is able to walk, I would first recommend getting clearance from your physiatrist or your primary care physician prior to exercise. Um, and consider seeing a physical therapist to evaluate your pattern of movement to make sure you're, um, you have good biomechanical alignment. When, when, I say, when I say biomechanical alignment, what I mean is that the forces that are going through your joints, your muscles, your tendons, and your ligaments are in alignment. Um, and so uh, you'd want to meet with a, a physical therapist to establish a solid exercise program for strength training and aerobics training. And um, some of the alternatives for uh, somebody who is walking, but it, it may be that the walking is not getting their exertion to that moderate level. So you could potentially think about some other um, exercises such as hand cycling, if there are too many forces forces going through your joints and in, um, in not a great way. So you can consider hand cycling, um, adaptive bicycling. It could be with your upper body or your lower body, um, aquatic therapy, swimming, things like that. Wheelchair sports are also available for people who are ambulatory, but they can't run. So many organizations will actually provide a wheelchair for a person with spina bifida, for example, who has myelomeningocele. They want to exercise, but they can't get their heart rate at, up adequately through walking. Um, and if they are interested in a sport, many organizations um, would have devices available. And if a person doesn't like sports, there's also things like adaptive community-based arts activities um, or recreation activities such as paddling or canoeing. Um, and I would also recommend getting involved in a general overall um, strength training program at least two times a week. And again, you could start out with a physical therapist to establish a program and transition that to a community-based gym. The second question is, what are alternatives? Sorry. Did I? Sorry about that. I hit hit the screen. <laughs> this um, the other question is, what are alternatives to walking and other aerobic exercise for those who have challenging or painful mobility? So, if you have challenging or painful mobility, you know that could be again because of those abnormal forces through the joints. So, um, activities that are um, let uh, uh, exert less forces through the joints might be things like swimming, um, cycling again, either upper or lower body, adaptive kayaking or rowing. Rowing is something that you can find. Um, many gyms have a rower that you can work out in the gym, or sometimes people will actually do adaptive rowing where they're getting on the water with a group or an organization that provides um, that type of support and has the proper equipment and the training to lift the person in or to help the person to transfer into the, to the boat. And so the other things that you could do if you have painful mobility, um, I mean, first you want to get clearance from your physician, of course, because if you have something that's very painful, there may be an actual physical or medical problem going on that you want to adjust first before you get yourself involved into an exercise program. So do that first. Um, and then, you know, there's many exercise videos available through the National Center for Health, Physical Activity and Disability website. And um, these videos have been vetted by people and other people have used them. And the nice thing about a video, an exercise video, if you are um, feeling more pain, you can stop the video or you can, you can stop the video to finish the exercise 
that's being shown, maybe you just need more time to do it. Maybe you need to do the exercises more slowly. And then one of the other questions was, um, a person walks with short bilateral leg AFO braces. Their arthritis is worsening with age. What exercises are the safest and most beneficial um, for maintaining their leg muscles and their joints? And so, you know, this for for a person who's who's wearing short leg braces, you still you, you don't want to ignore the lower extremity muscles. If there is still active movement in the dorsiflexors and plantar flexors of the feet, that would be important to, to work those muscles and to get a strengthening program for those, um, even though you're wearing AFOs. And also the quadriceps. And when I say dorsiflexion and plantar flexion, what I mean is that dorsiflexion means you pull your toes up towards your head. Plantar flexion means you point your toes down. So those are the muscles in your ankles that move the ankles. And then there also the quadricep muscle, that's the muscle that would like extend your knee out. So it, ex it would make your lower leg come out. So that's the muscle at the top of your, um, on your thigh, on the top of your thigh. So strengthening the quadricep muscle is important, but also we want to get a good muscle balance. So we want to strengthen the muscles on the back of the leg too. And that would be the hamstrings. So, and also people with, um, some people with spina bifida walk with what we call a trendelenburg gait. We see this a lot where there's more side to side um, ex extraneous or extra movement. And that happens when the muscles on the side of the hips are weak. And so what's helpful if you have a strengthening program that also includes strengthening those muscles of the hip on the sides of the hip. So that would be my potentially, you know, an example would be laying on your side and then elevating that leg up, up to the side. And what you want to make sure that you're in good alignment. And so again, with any kind of strengthening program, it's helpful to start out with either an inclusive fitness trainer or a personal trainer who has experience working with people with disabilities or um, a physical therapist. And so that then somebody else asked, um, I hope that answers that question. Uh, somebody else asked, what are uh, tips on recovery from heavy exercise? So first, it sounds like the person who asked this may be engaged in vigorous physical activity. So remember that the recommendations are for 150 minutes a week of moderate intensity physical activity or 75 minutes of vigorous intensity uh, physical activity or a combination of both. And that the way that we typically measure that, you know, whether we're in that moderate range or vigorous range is through rating a perceived exertion. And we can also use the talk test as well. So that just means, you know, if you're in that vigorous range, like it sounds like this person who asked the question is, then it's probably very hard for them to, you know, they probably can't say more than a word or two because they're breathing so hard in that vigorous range. What I would recommend for recovery on heavy exercise is to slow the body down and not just stop. You don't wanna just stop. Um, you want to gradually decrease the intensity of the exercise that you're engaged in and making sure that you're bringing your rating of perceived exertion down and your breathing rate is slowing down to the point that you can have a conversation and talk. That's how you'll, you'll know, one of the ways you'll know, or you can use the rating of perceived exertion scale. Then at the end of your exercise session, you want to include some dynamic stretches. And I mentioned, you know, some of the stretches in the first talk, dynamic stretching, stretching just means you're using large muscles of the, of the body to, you know, that can gradually help you to cool down. And then at the end of your session, incorporate the static stretches, meaning, you know, you may be holding um, a stretch for you know 30 seconds because your body is already warmed up so you can get some nice um, muscle length and a nice stretch at the end of that. Next slide, please. And um, just before we go to the next slide, and did you um, also, were you able to address the question about safe exercise for spina bifida occulta? Um, um, 
hang on one second. Um, sorry. <laughs> um, as far as you know, spina bifida occulta, there really wouldn't be, and I would I would first make sure that the person check with their physician. Um, they're they're they may not have very many limitations, so they could you know, likely do a variety of exercises that um, they may not have the, you know, limitations that would be, you know, similar to maybe somebody who has myeloid meningitis. Hill. So, um, yeah. Thank you. Sure. Sorry to jump there. Okay, next. Okay. Um, right. So the next slide talks about um, the one question was, um, how can you get someone with an intellectual disability to understand the importance of eating healthy? How can they engage in physical activity and find exercises that will work if they use a power chair and have limited stability due to having no strength in their abdominal muscles? Um, first of all, people with intellectual disabilities can exercise. Um, there's not a limitation. There's no limitation because of the intellectual disability, but they may require um, more time with training. So they may require more repetition to learn to do the exercise in a way that's biomechanically correct. Like I mentioned, the joints and there's, um, you're going for the best alignment you, that you can possibly get. Um, also, uh, Special Olympics is an organization that provides physical activity competitions for people, specifically for people with intellectual disabilities. And there's even Paralympic sports where there's categories for people who have intellectual disabilities. So you can see that there really is no limitation to the height of the physical conditioning that a person who has spina bifida and has an intellectual disability could reach. Now, in terms of using a power chair, there are a variety of sports. There's power soccer. Um, they call it power football in England. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of different activities that the person could do, like finding something that the family can do together. So, you know, potentially, you know, if they have some, um, they may not have the core strength, maybe they have some upper body strength where they could um, be engaged in hand cycling. So there's various types of hand cycles. Some hand cycles are more like a competitive hand cycle where you're uh, lower to the ground and that may be harder to transfer, but they also make upright hand cycles. So that transfer, it, it likely would be assisted, but um, there are organizations that help with um, teaching families how to um, do those transfers into those types of types of devices. And that's something that a family could exercise together. You could do cycling together. So, um, and there's no reason why that person as well couldn't be involved in a strength training program, but it is finding, um, it is finding uh, working with somebody to establish a solid exercise program so that we're looking at, you know, preventing injury and having a good program. So again, seeing the physiatrist to get clearance for exercise, working with a physical therapist or an inclusive fitness trainer or a personal trainer who has experience um, would be ideal. What are some ways we can stay fit at a gym or home is another question. What equipments and workouts can you suggest? And so I would recommend um, for home-based physical activity, uh, you could look at the National Center for Health, Physical Activity and Disability website. It's NCHPAD in all caps. And they have specific resources for people with spina bifida that um, they have not only resources like written resources, but also exercise videos. And so, for example, one of the videos that I saw showed, it, it was nice because it showed three pe people, one person was standing doing the exercise. Um, one person was using um, a device um, like a, a cane, and the other person was sitting. So they had people doing the exercise um, in different at different levels. And so there there are a number of, of, of videos in there. And the nice thing about a video is that 
if you need more time on an exercise, like say the exercise is going along, they're doing so many repetitions. If you're doing the repetition slower, there's nothing wrong with that. You can stop the video, finish your repetitions and then start it again. So, or if you need a rest. So it gives you that sort of freedom to um, do the video at your own pace, I would say. In terms of equipment, um, you know, this is all gonna be dependent on the person. There are an, a variety of types of equipment. So for strength training equipment, um, I would recommend latex-free TheraBand. If you just Google latex-free TheraBand, there's a number of companies that come up that provide those. Um, you know, you could look for if you're engaged in, um, and this isn't, if, if you're at a gym that has a pool, for example, and you want to do strength training in the pool, there are sort of barbells that are made out of foam that provide that resistance in the water. Um, there's things like Aqua Zumba that the that people do at a gym where there, there's a float that supports them in the water and they're moving their arms and um, getting that aerobic activity. So, um, but I would recommend with any kind of fitness program, starting low and going slow with any aerobic and strength training. So you don't want to, you know, just jump right in and um, do everything, but just start very low, like low resistance. If you're doing a strength training program, start with low resistance and you can gradually build that up over time. Um, the last thing is said, a person asked, I read that people with spina bifida shouldn't lift more than five pounds. Is this correct and why? And how can you find a trainer? Um, so there's really, there's no set amount that people with spina bifida can lift. I, I think that might be um, not necessarily correct because there's power lifters who have spina bifida who are lifting you know, more than their body weight. So um, we can't really say that there's a limit. It, it may be that the person who wrote this, maybe their physician gave them a limit because they had a surgery. So I would, again, check with your physician, but, um, and, but I would work with a personal trainer to gradually increase the amount of weight you're lifting. And you, you want to schedule, you know, um, like, for example, when you're lifting, you, you're, you're, you may be working on the front of your body one day and the back of your body the next day. So you alternate, you give yourself rest breaks in between um, and things like that. As far as finding a trainer, um, there there is there are certified inclusive fitness trainers. There's not a lot of them. So they're dispersed throughout the United States. And I can find see if I can find the resource and and uh, ask um want to, to send that to, out to you, to everybody. Um, and you can talk, talk to your fitness center as well. You know, one of the things when you go to a fitness center, you want to find out, you know, you want to determine, is this the right place for me to work out? Is it accessible? You know, is it, um, do, does the literature that they provide talk about people with disabilities and how they support people with disabilities? Are the classes um, inclusive? Is there space between the exercise equipment, uh, adequate space to transfer to and from the exercise equipment? Do they allow a caregiver to go with you to help you to transfer on and off the exercise equipment? Um, you also could ask them, you know, sometimes fitness centers will um, provide a discounted rate if there's only, if the only piece of equipment that you can use there is an arm ergometer, which is an arm arm bike that you crank to get aerobic exercise, um, or maybe just the pool. Those are the two things you can use. You can ask them if they have a discounted rate um, and if your caregiver can attend with you um, and not them, them not charge them. So those are all discussions that you have to have with a fitness center to find out. And, and you can ask if they have a personal trainer who um, who is, is familiar and is 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 able to provide you with a good a solid exercise plan. Next slide. Um, and so this person asked, I have a hard time losing weight in my stomach. Do you have suggestions? I'm 54 and do not walk or stand. So really, I mean, there's not we're really not going to be able to do what this sounds like the person's looking for like spot training. 
um, or spot reduction, like just reducing certain areas of your body. Really what, what I would recommend is having just an overall solid physical activity program that involves all the components, including stretching, strengthening, and aerobics, which is, you know, cardio when you get your heart rate up that you can modify as needed. Um, the best bet for weight management, which it sounds like this person is interested in, is pairing it um, with the recommendations that Dr. Whalen made for nutrition. So that combination of physical activity and nutrition is what's recommended for a healthy lifestyle behavior program and rather than just physical activity alone. So pairing that um, is is going to be overall helpful to your overall health and to your overall um, you know, body composition. I would say incorporating weight training, strength training with, with um, would be important. Um, that can help to increase your energy expenditure. And um, in terms of the person who asked this doesn't walk or stand. So, but there's many different types of physical activity that you can do if you don't walk or stand. So if you don't walk, I mentioned before, there's a variety of exercises, there's swimming, you can use the NCHPAD uh, videos that are available. Um, it's nice to include a variety of activities because that way you're not working the same muscle groups in the same way all the time. So, you know, maybe one day or two days a week you swim, maybe a couple of days you do some aerobic videos and it's nice to mix it up because then you don't get bored. Um, you know, and it's important to build in recovery days. So, um, you know, alternate the days that you work out and remember that you don't have to do, we want to avoid the weekend warrior syndrome. So just going all out on the weekend and then not doing anything during the week, it's helpful to spread those 150 minutes a week of moderate intensity physical activity throughout your week. So, you know, 30 minutes each day, or you can even break it into 10 minutes a day. The next question is, where can I find wheelchair exercises? Again, I'd recommend the National Center for Health, Physical Activity and Disability website. There's also on YouTube, um, I've done some searches myself and I've vetted or just, you know, reviewed some, um, some, uh, you know, different types of videos to, to, to recommend to people and um, just making sure that they're, you know, relatively safe. And um, so you can, you can check on YouTube too, if you look for wheelchair exercises, I would view the video first, you know, and maybe talk to your physical therapist um, just to make sure that it seems safe. But again, the NCHPAD videos have been vetted. Um, in terms of how can a full-time wheelchair user know if they're getting their daily steps? I mean, the Apple Watch actually, and I know that they're expensive, so not everybody's going to have one. But if you do have an Apple Watch, the algorithms in there have been tested uh, with wheelchair users. So there is a, um, a wheelchair, uh, a way to um, record your amount of exercise for wheelchair users. And other than that, you also you know, you, you also can go by your intensity. So you, you can go by your distance. There's a lot of things you can measure. You can go by your distance. So how far did you go? How much time did it take you? So say if you have a certain route that you're going, um, I gave the example in the first talk that we did, um, it was a person who was a student who was trying to get across campus and uh, less time. So they had a set distance that they typically went and they were trying to reduce the distance. So they increased their, um, they added in hills, they increased their intensity over time and they ended up, you know, being able to get there in a, in a quicker time. So, um, so there's a lot of different ways, objective ways that you can measure um, the amount of, of work that you're doing. And the last two questions, does it matter what level of spina bifida you have to the amount of exercise you, sh you, sh you should get? Really, the physical activity guidelines are for all Americans, including people with disabilities. So regardless of the level of spina bifida, you want to have a nice comprehensive program that includes all those components, stretching, strengthening, and aerobics. And the same same applies. If you're, if you're not at that level of 150 minutes a week, it's okay. You want to start 
where you're at and ramp up. And in the first lesson we, we did, I gave an example of how you can ramp that up. You want to apply the fit principle. So you only want to change one variable. And the fit principle stands for frequency, intensity, time, and type. And that's how we identify, you know, what type of activity we're doing, the intensity we're doing at, at, are we start, if we're starting at light intensity, then maybe we increase the next week, you know, or after a couple of weeks of light intensity, we increase to moderate intensity. So frequency, intensity, time, the amount of time we're spending. And so we're using the FIT principle to, you know, help us to identify um, the type of exercise we're doing and the amount that we're doing in the um, exertion that we're that we're putting out when we're doing that exercise. So that would apply to everybody, regardless of your level. And it's okay, like I said, get, if you start if you start low, that's okay. You know, it, it might be that you're one of the things you might want to consider doing too is just decreasing sedentary behavior. Sedentary behavior means that you're just sitting. Um, you're sitting and you're not doing any kind of exertion. You may be working at a job that's sedentary where you're on the computer all day. Well, taking breaks every hour and taking a couple minutes to, you know, wheel around the house just to get your heart rate up and get into that moderate range for a few minutes every hour. And you can add those minutes up and that can, that can go towards that 150 minutes that you're trying to get to. Um, and then the last question, I believe, is that where do you find latex-free and less expensive exercise equipment? Again, I would look online. It's hard for me to, I can't really recommend specific types of resources, um, but, you know, look for latex-free therabands, look for barbells for swimming, um, and um, and I would that's what I would recommend. That's all I have. Thank you so much. We really appreciate that. And then we'll now we'll go on to our next section on weight related behaviors. Um, and so for that, um, Michelle, I believe that you were going to take this question. I will. Um, so this is a really good question as far as this person gained weight from a medication they were on and they're no longer on the medication, but now they have bad sugar cravings along with the chronic pain and fatigue. And what can I do? And I will um, ask anyone else that wants to talk also to open this up. But my first of all suggestion is whenever you're going to be starting on a medication, if you um, are aware that it has weight gain associated, associated with it, it's okay to ask your provider, is there an alternative that could be used because you don't want to deal with the weight gain that's going to be a side effect. But obviously that's not always able to be done. Once the weight is on, it is much harder to get off. Um, I will agree with that. The sugar part of this is a uh, issue because sugar has been, it's very addicting in, in certain ways. Your body gets used to it and then you do start to crave it. And I think the point to make about this is our society has so much sugar in foods that we are not even aware of. So first of all, taking an inventory of what you're eating every day and looking at how much sugar you're actually consuming, because we know the uh, typical American is eating way too much sugar. And the sugar that I'm talking about is not always things that we think about like cakes or cookies, but it's going to be hidden in things like pasta sauces or spaghetti sauce or yogurt or um, sodas and other things that you might think about. And sometimes it's surprising where the sugar is hidden. So asking or looking at how to read a food label to understand what is the amount of added sugar in the food taking an inventory of how much you're eating in a day and then slowly starting to wean it down. And it does need to be slow because you will feel that um, that craving, but you can eventually remove the, the extra sugars from your diet and do much better and they will reduce the cravings. Does anyone have anything to add to that? Okay. Okay. And next, now we have weight-related research. Oh, we love research, and we love that someone asked about research. That means that we're um, hoping that you'll all participate in research. And this person specifically said they want to know more about clinical trials or how to participate in research for spina bifida. So there is a couple ways you can go about this. And for clinical trials specifically, there is a website that you can go to, and it's clinicaltrials.gov. 
the government website and any clinical trial should register their study with this website. If you go to that website, it will allow you to search all the different clinical trials going on and if they are looking for participants and you can even search by diagnosis. So if you are interested, um, I looked at it earlier, there's different studies out there and that would be one way to do that, um, to find some studies that you might be able to participate in. And then the other one is really paying attention to your organizations like Spina Bifida Association, who oftentimes will be sharing different opportunities for um, research that come out. And then don't be afraid to jump on board and start. And with any research, when you are asked to do a research study, there will always be a consent um, time where someone will explain the study to you. And you always should know that it's voluntary and you're never going to be tied into it. You can easily say no at any point. So it's not a bad idea just to ask questions and to listen to about the research that's being presented. Great. Thank you very much. Yes. And now we have a question about weight and age related changes. Okay, I might be the oldest person here, so I will, I'll take this question. <laughs> now, um, for tips on dealing with weight gain and menopause, um, I do want to say that weight gain and menopause and spina bifida, when we're looking at it that way, the spina bifida component doesn't really help or hurt. It's really that there is weight gain with menopause. And we have to recognize that weight gain that occurs during menopause is partially related to menopause and hormones, but it's also partially related to age changes that we're doing and things that go along with our age as we age. So one thing is that as we age, we lose muscle mass. And this was already discussed a little bit with Dr. Kreitzer as far as needing to have our muscle mass, because the more muscle mass we have, the more calories we burn or the more energy we expend. So if our body is gradually losing muscle mass over the years, then, and we're continuously eating what we normally were eating previously, there's going to be a gradual amount of weight gain becomes because you're gonna have more calories going in and you're gonna have the slow decrease of calories going out. So be careful as you age to consider and reassess how much you're eating in a day. Now, things you can do to combat that for the um, weight muscle mass is when you are doing your exercise, adding in that resistance training or um, different um, muscle exercises for building muscle is really helpful to maintain your muscle mass and to help expend more energy in the day or burn more calories. And then the other part that I wanted to mention is sleep. Um, sleep can really play a large component of our weight and it's becoming more recognized. If we're not getting good sleep at night, we generally will wake up tired and then we're not usually making the best choices during the day. So you might not be as active during the day. You might not feel like you can do that extra exercise that you should be doing. Um, or you might just really um, cut corners when it's coming to eating. Instead of making that meal, you might just buy something or pre-made or convenience foods. So the sleep component is important to make sure you're getting good sleep, quality sleep. And I just tie that in because we know at menopause, there are some different changes in our sleep habits too. So, and then the last thing I'll say is just being cautious with those empty calories and alcohol consumption that can really tack on um, weight without even recognizing it because they build up over time. Oh. Can I take this one too? Um, <laughs> finish this one off. Uh, medications and weight management. So I'm guessing um, if we asked everyone in the room if we've heard about medications and weight management, the questions are specific to our GLP-1 agonists, which you hear of different names. And this person nicely put down multiple names that are known, Zepbound, Munjaro, Wengovi, Ozempic, um, and about the GI side effects. And then the second question ties right into this. And it was asking about if a person with senior, senior person with spina bifida and a neurogenic bowel with a daily inconsistent bowel maintenance plan and diabetes and obesity, if they should not take these medications, but their internist thought it was an okay. So I think this is a nice discussion to put both of these questions together. And because this is such a hot topic, I do want to give a little explanation about it because I think that you're going to continuously hear more about it and I want you to be educated on it. So these medications were initially made for type 2 diabetes and they are um, called as a category GLP-1 agonists. They mimic a hormone in our body that will stimulate insulin to be produced and they reduce blood sugar then and they also improve our insulin, insulin sensitivity. By doing this, they also slow down our digestion and our gastric emptying. So if you think about that, and if you're not having food excreted as quickly, you're gonna feel full longer and you're not gonna be as hungry. And that's how these medications really help that 
piece. And there's something that happens in our brain too with our satiety signals. So they've been very successful. Um, people are losing 15 to 20% of their body weight. Um, but the differences are, as they have now not only been used for type 2 diabetes, at a higher dose, they can be used for weight management. And that's what the companies have figured out. And there's a lot of testing, a lot of research going on. And now they're even trying to combine some of these medications to make new medications. So I guarantee you're going to hear a lot more options coming out and a lot more names that are going to be associated with this. Um, that being said, they are costly. They are not readily available for everyone, nor should they be for everyone. They have a lot of contraindications. And um, there are concerns that if you stop taking them, that the weight gain would come right back. And so being, that being said, going back to the original question of the GI side effects, some of the primary side effects that are associated with these drugs because of the gastric emptying and the digestion process is that the um, side effects that are people that complain about the most, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and reflux. And if you have a very precarious uh, bowel and bladder regimen, um, that is probably going to be where you're going to notice the side effects. And so it's always a concern. There is not a specific contraindication that says individuals with spina bifida should not use these, but it is very individual based and it would be very much a discussion between yourself and a provider. That being said, these medications are being um, provided through the internet and not always in the right medication being provided. And there's a lot of things that are concerned with safety of what you're buying uh, because they are such a hot commodity and because they are expensive, people are doing some bad things with them. So I would suggest if you have a good provider, an internist, and they are interested in talking to you about this, hear them out, talk about your bubble plan and talk about how risky it would be for you to, to do something. If they put you on a medication, they will probably start very low dose and slow gradual increases, which does help reduce side effects. Um, they also are going to confirm that you must have a um, dietary changes along with this and also increase your water intake. So you might not be hungry and people are skipping meals, but you really need to have small good meals. And if it's done correctly, this is an opportunity to make better choices and to change your eating habits. So that is the good part. Um, that, so I, I think it's something else that you have to really consider and it has to be an individual decision and it really would not be a, a general answer that I could give that one that it would fit for everyone in the room or anyone that's going to listen to this, but it could be some individual discussions. And then the next question about antibiotics causing weight gain. So I think that, you know, a lot of people would say, no, antibiotics do not cause weight gain. And I think that's pretty true, but uh, looking in the literature and looking at evidence, and there is some evidence out there that says there's a small increase of um, weight gain after repeated use of some antibiotics because how it can change your microbiome. And the only study I'm going to tell you about is that a study that was done in children that had a lot of repeat antibiotic use as a child. And then at age 15, they looked at their weight and they saw that there was a modest amount of increased weight when compared to those that did not have as many antibiotics. The change in the weight was three pounds. So I don't think this is something that A, you should ever say, I don't want to be on an antibiotic because if you need to be on an antibiotic and it's for um, a proper use, we don't want to recommend overusing them, but obviously you would not say no to that. And then you also have to be um, cautious to not put too much into this. If there is research being done in adults, I couldn't find the specific numbers to say that there is or is not weight gain. But even if there is, it appears to be a relatively small amount. And so going back to the original health habits we were talking about with um, diet changes and activity, um, it's most important. And when you look up something like macrobid, um, it will say it does not, it's not associated with weight gain. So that is the direct answer. But I'm just saying behind the scenes in the science, there could be some things that are coming out, but it's very minimal mm -hmm. and not something that I would... Um, say that is going to be our major factor here from, we have a lot of other things that we're dealing with that are causing weight gain and it's not the antibiotics as much. The last thing I will say on this slide is um, if you have questions for providers, we know that providers all have the best intentions in your questions that you want to be answered. Um, when it comes to obesity, not all providers have had the same amount of training in obesity and especially as new things like these medications are developing. So um, always talk to your provider first, but I do want to put a note out there in the, and I think it'll be in the chat, 
there are some websites that are reputable that have um, ability to find providers who did extra training or additional training in obesity. And they are across the nation. So you can look by your region and you can see, and that might be something that might be useful for someone listening. Uh, the Obesity Medicine Association, they will have providers listed and they can be listed at a clinician level, fellow level, or diplomat level. The diplomat level just meant that they are actually board certified um, in obesity medicine. So that would be your highest level of someone that has expertise in obesity. And then um, Obesity Action Coalition and the clinicians and fellows are more people that have done some training or additional certificates, but not as high as that um, board medicine training. So just to put a plug out there that there are providers that have a little bit extra training and it's not the, it's just not across the board consistent. And I think that's all I have. Thank you. I think that brings us to the close. Juanita, was that the last slide with, of questions? Yes. That was the last slide. Thank you so much. That was it. Yes. Well, thank you all for joining us this evening. And thank you so much um, to our experts for um, just such wonderful information and for taking the time to prepare and answer the questions that um, the community has asked. So thank you again, and um, everyone have a wonderful evening.